The Beating Heart of Creation A 5 Emil DMT trip report uploaded to the Actualize.org forums by Brittle Buddha Set Anticipation Reassured Confidence Setting A magical and inviting seaside home Substance 100 milligrams of toad venom 15 to 20 milligrams of 5 MeO DMT Tool Eclipse vaporizer Method One long inhalation Prologue Almost a year since my first, and six months from my second and most recent experience with this miraculous substance, I found myself in the comfortable home and company of our beloved facilitators. I recently felt called once again, and had reached out to them. As is usual for me, the weeks after a date had been set were a time of highly charged energy, with many emotions coming to the surface, including anticipation, excitement, but also anxiety and fear. I'm a fairly timid psychonaut, and the facing and transmuting of these energies plays a significant part in my journey. Jeremy and Luna were joined this day by Tom, who has been developing alongside them recently as a facilitator. Tom met me as I waited outside, and interviewed me as to my history and intentions regarding dosage and the like. I'm thinking somewhere in the 100 milligrams range, I said. Okay, absolutely, he said. I'll speak with Jeremy, but I'm sure that'll be fine. Tom is a kind, empathetic, and confidence-inspiring presence, and I soon found myself at greater ease. Tom would be administering the sacrament that day. Once inside, warm greetings were exchanged with Jeremy and Luna. Tom says you're interested in 100 milligrams, Jeremy half asked. I think that'll be beautiful. Here by yourself today, he continued. My previous two ceremonies had been in the company of my son Mason, whose absence was keenly felt. It's good to come alone at times. Preparations proceeded as I had become familiar. Body cleansed with sage, hands with Florida water. The late afternoon sun spilling its golden energy onto the active surface of the ocean, dancing outside and below the great west facing windows. The journey. The medicine was to be taken standing up, Jeremy behind to catch. The three practice breaths and one long slow deep inhale, arms slowly out and upward of the breath. Good, hold, said Tom. Look at me now, look into my eyes, he coaxed gently. It's okay, look right into my eyes. The familiar high-pitched metallic whine began. The silver web of energy coming up behind the objects in my vision. The faint sensation of falling backwards. Unlike my first experience, awareness was, to a degree, maintained this time. Unlike my second, the self was immediately incinerated in a roiling orange fractal plasma energy which moved, much like I imagine a nuclear blast would, unhindered through the less substantial substrates of my identity. And then, nothing. And everything. What was felt was a return home, to a timeless, placeless awareness both intimate and vast, without centre or edge. A sense of being, without definition or distinction. I cannot find the language to describe the state further, or whether intention or impression could shave meaning from it. I am left only with the memory of rapturous astonishment and gratitude. A newborn sense of awe and wonder, nestled safely in the certainty of unassailable being. The sensation was somewhat chaotic and unstable, however, as when deep asleep and trying to shake yourself out of a convincing nightmare. The power was almost too great to bear. Incendiary beauty, purity of energy, and a degree of aliveness uncontainable and uncontained. Again, words are no longer possible. This is where knowing fails. This is the domain of the heart. But the energy that arises at the door, as the final, boss-level duality, guarding the key to the palace of golden nectar, is the choice. The same choice that hides behind every seeming experience. To love, or to fear. To love, or to fear yourself. At the insistence of love, I surrendered. As reward, there was the sense of an endless, stacked, propagating barrage of orgasms, if orgasms are fueled by nitroglycerin. A perpetual, uncontrolled collapsing into and exploding out of the self in seeming response to the unsustainable attempt for it to be grasped. Thus began a period of spiritual inspiration and expiration, whereby some type of identity 
would form out of the mouth of the divine into a separate feeling, self-knowing state, and then suck back into the furnace of love to be further tempered and refined. I initially, possibly, misconstrued this point of the journey as an encounter of contractions formed from energetic shadows, concentric walls protecting the tower of the ego. Now I feel that each of these perturbations was the body-mind trying to reboot, trying to jumpstart and flee the existential threat of absolute love. Through grace and devotion, I was able to repeatedly let go and was joyously welcomed again and again, back into ever-deepening pools of bliss and self-knowing. Perhaps this is a model which helps describe the infinite expression of the one essence. The absolute divides away from itself, having been unable to bear the intensity of its own unfathomable power. To reduce the pressure, so to speak, as capillaries tame the raging blood of the pulsing arteries before gently returning it into the veins and back home to the heart. At various points, I would stop breathing, not the pathological loss of a vital function, but within the knowing that this tidal effort was no longer required for true living. At each cessation, I could feel the gentle fanning of deeply perfumed air onto my face at the urging of my loving guides. Breathe. Finally, as a last attempt to hijack self-realization, the body-mind opened its eyes and was met with a dizzying world of infinitely reflecting, fractal webs of translucent and iridescent-seeming stained glass, each panel filled with iterations of the same loving feminine face, sometimes just the mouth, sometimes just the eyes, each reflecting the other like Indra's net. It was almost enough to pull me from the experience, but I was still very, very deep. Thinking that the trip was supposed to be over though, I felt powerless and afraid. Panicking slightly, I thought, briefly, about calling out for help, that I wanted it to stop. But for one last time, I found the courage to surrender, and was finally rewarded with the lesson I had come here to learn. The seas calmed, the fever broke, and in that moment it showed its face. My face. I love you, it said to me. As me. Through me. I love you. I love you. I love you. It was God professing its love for me, and for itself. It was me proclaiming my love for myself and for God. And it was God and I, as one, declaring our unconditional love for all that is, which only ever is, this moment, this message, this truth. There was the sense that I had made it, that it was over now. Opening my eyes through tears, I sobbed. Thank you for not letting me stop before I got there. Thank you for giving me the courage to keep going all the way through to the end, to myself, to love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now fully aware of the glory of this mysterious, improbable, miraculous gift of life, I yelled out, What the fuck? Oh my fucking god! Life is too good to be true. As I came to more fully, there were the usual symmetrical arm movements and hand mudras. I lay back to enjoy the fading sacred geometry and revel in the gentle stream of downloading wisdoms. Tom appeared at my side. You did so good, he whispered lovingly. You are so worthy of love. I held his hand and cried like a newborn in service of love. That is what we are. That is all there is. Love. Forever moving into and out of itself. We are the blood of the beating heart of creation.